Okay, hello everybody. Um, this is Mr. Art coming at you over the interwebs. Actually, this is my classroom. Uh, and I have students in the classroom right now. Uh, and we're about to do a lesson, our first lesson on Python. Yes. Okay. So first things first, you guys follow along with me, okay? So I'd like you to, uh, you ha you know, go to these websites and let's open up a browser first, okay? And so the first thing we're gonna do on the internet is let's go and check out my website. Yeah, Mr. Ark has a website. Hmm. I wonder if we could see what the website is. And for some reason, I'm dead. What? Oh no. Uh oh. This is not good. I haven't even started teaching yet, and my computer's not working. What happened? Let's try and start it again. No! Now my VNC session isn't working. Oh, God. All right. Oh, here we go. Who said that? You fail right now. <laughs> okay. No, I'm kidding. Uh, God, I'd be a bad teacher uh, if I failed my students just for uh, making bad comments about Linux. All right, here we go. Um, yay, it's working now. All right, let's go to my website. It is, now you type it in too, Archelesian, that's my name, don't wear it out, dot com forward slash CS1. Yep, there it is. Oh, in all its glory. How beautiful. Wow, Mr. Ark, it must have taken you over a year to make that website. A little bit more. Okay. So what is this website? Let's take a look here. It says getting started. Let's click that. Hey, hey, we need three things. The software, the editor, and the textbook. Okay, let's click on software first. Python 3. Now, here is a video for your viewing pleasure on how to install Python 3 on Windows 10. Now when you go home tonight, or when, if you are at home, uh, you can do this on your own computer. Windows doesn't come with Python automatically. You have to install it, okay? On the other hand, if you're using Linux, then you'd have it automatically. Uh, but what about Mac? I know what you're thinking. Oh, I didn't forget you guys. Yep, so you cool kids can also install Python, but I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, yeah, but Mr. Ark, I thought Mac OS comes with Python. You'd be right, sir, but it only comes with Python 2, version 2, and we're going to be learning Python 3 because we're awesome. And so therefore... You will, need to, you will need to install Python 3 as well. You can follow the video there, and to do ta-da, boom, your computer will have Python 3. Excellent. Now, just in case you want to see where everything is, uh, you can, well, you can open up a new tab and go to python.org, okay? And Ta-da! There it is, python.org, in its glory. You can click on Downloads, and you just have to click Download Python. Don't do that now, okay, because this isn't, you, I've already got it installed, so you don't need to do it. You do it when you go home tonight, okay? And um, you, you got to get the right version for you. It, this website kind of tries to detect, you know, it knows I'm running Linux, so... It won't show me the Windows and Mac OS stuff, but those videos that I have for you will explain how to do it on your operating system. All right? 
But I'm going to show you, I actually, I'm going to prove to you that I have it installed. Let's open a terminal here. When I go to console, see that it says console? That's right, I'm running KDE because I'm a cool kid. Spelled K O O L. And um, so we're going to go Python and hit enter. Oh no! It's Python version 2. That's not good. Well, don't fret. You can hit control D to get out of there. Control D. Right? And then you can type in arrow up or just type in Python again if you're if you like typing. And hit put a 3 at the end and now you'll notice to do tada, we've got Python version 3 on these computers. Yes. That's what we want. And you can, you can have that on your home computer as well because it's free and it's open source and it's an awesome language and you're going to learn it. So that's Python. So go home and do that. Now what else do you need? That's the first thing you need. Second thing you need is an editor. Uh-oh. Holy war detected. Yes, that's right. Uh, lots of people feel super strong about their editors. Some people will say Microsoft Visual Studio. Dun, dun, dun. Some people will say Sublime Text. Oh, yeah. And some people will say Vim for the win. So if you're wondering what those things are, so look at this. This is the editor that I use. It's called Vim. Oh, look, I've got a sticker of it on my computer. Ha ha. See, I'm a cool kid. Now, uh, if you go to Vim, don't try using this one. Honestly, you, if you, as soon as you start this editor, you will be stuck inside of it forever. You will never be able to quit the program and that's a running joke but the point is that it's got a learning curve and it's not for beginners and you my friends are beginners so use something that's easier to learn okay uh, now the one that I have chosen that I think is good for you is genie Let's see if that's the right website. Yay! Now, if you don't want to remember this stuff, if you go back to my website, there's a link to it right there. Okay? That'll take you to Genie. And what is Genie? It's a flyweight IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. Right? It allows you to code, and we're not going to be using Notepad. Ugh. And, um, but you're going to have to download this. Okay, so you'll click on download and go to releases. And when you go to releases, notice if you're running Windows, grab the one that says EXE. If you're using Mac OS, grab the one that says DMG. And yeah, if you're using Linux, it would be something like sudo app get install genie. But don't worry about it because I've already done it for you. Look, if you click on the KDE and ta-da, there it is. It will be in development. See that? Yes. Awesome. Click on Genie and that's what it looks like. Wow. Exciting, isn't it? Well, we're not going to use it just yet because we don't really know how to, pi uh, how to code yet in Python. But you still need this and we'll be using it a lot and now let's go back to our getting started section and there's also oh my god there's videos on how to install this that's right if you are slightly you know computer phobic and you're not really sure how to install programs don't worry there's videos how to showing you how to do it this one actually uh, shows you how to install Python but We've already done that, so you can skip that part. And that's right, if you're on a Mac, 
I've got that one too. Whoa, this is nice. Professional. I like it. Well, now let's go to the third piece of the puzzle, the book. And this is where you're going to learn stuff. And guess what? Python's free? Bing. No, maybe I shouldn't be using that word. Uh, ding. And the editor is free? Genie? Open source? Yep. And now finally, let's see what the book is. How much does it cost? <gasps> it's free! It's by Swaroop. And he's released it under the Creative Commons license. Oh, I love it. Look at that. The book is online. Wait. But, Mr. Ark, what if I can't access the internet all the time? That's okay. Because you can download the PDF file. <gasps> and you can just read it even when you're not when you don't have internet access. Okay, now EPUB is for like e-readers, but you're gonna be using a computer, so you're gonna want the PDF. And and then I know what someone's gonna say in, in the classroom. They're gonna say, Mr. Ark, I, I don't know what a PDF is, and I don't think have I have a program that can open that. No problem. You see, if you scroll down here, it says note. If you download a PDF, you're gonna need a viewing software. And that would be Adobe Acrobat Reader. Okay? So you can download that for uh, Windows. And I think they have it for Mac as well. Okay? And so there it is. So let's go back to the textbook. Oh, and by the way, if you want more textbooks, look at this. You can go more free textbooks. I'm sure you figured out by now I like things that are free. There's another one, Think Python. Whoa, that's a good one, by the way. And I think that's another version of that one. And that one's not really Python. Or maybe it is, actually. That one's not. Whoa, digital signal processing? Not for this course, no. Python for everybody. Wait, where is the program, or where is the pro the book that we're using? Is ah, oh, there it is, Swaroop, a bite of Python. Yay, they've got ours too. Nice. Okay. Anyways, uh, let's just open up the book here, and there it is. And what do we do now? Well, we can. The introduction is basically, you know. Uh, who reads the book? Lots of people do. It's a great book. And there's a dedication to it. And there is a preface. Who is this book for? And finally, there is about. So today, we're going to go through the three sections about Python, installation, and first steps. First of all, uh, yeah. Python was named after the BBC show Pi Monty Python's Flying Circus. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a simple language to learn, which is good. Simple is good. It's easy to learn. That's excellent for beginners. And it's free and open source for the win. Um, it's a high-level language. Now, what does that mean? What's a low-level language? Well, low-level language is very, very close to the computer, like assembly or, C or even C would be considered more of a lower-level language. But we're not going to learn those things. Those are hard to program in. High-level languages are close to English. It's almost like you're talking to the computer and telling it what to do in English. That's high-level. That's Python. It's portable. It'll run on anything. Literally, it, it'll run on Mac, Windows, Linux, even not just operating systems. It'll run on um, like any type of computer too. A whole bunch of different types of computers it'll run on. Wow, even a PlayStation. I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, it's interpreted. It means it's not compiled like some other languages. It's a scripted language. So you run the source code. Very cool. 
Okay, you can look at the source code and just run it. There's nothing. There's no intermediary steps, at least none that you'll see. And it's object oriented. Although this course, uh, we're not going to be doing object oriented programming. Uh, we will in the next course. Whew. Uh, it's extensible. That means there's a specific word for this, and you guys should uh, learn this word. It's called batteries included. Right? When you buy something, it's got batteries included, that's Python. It's a very famous saying. It means that, um, oh no, that was this part. Not extensible part, but extensive libraries. That's batteries included. So it's got a lot of things built into it. Okay, there it is. This is called, they even put that in there. Nice, batteries included philosophy. And so then there's versions 2 and 3, but 2 is gone now. We're not going to live in the past. We're going to learn Python 3. What programmers say, they love it. Yay. And so do I. And so will you. And then let's go to installation. Well, guess what? We've already got it installed here, and you're going to install it on your home computer tonight. Okay. And once you do install it on your home computer tonight, give me a thumbs up. Um, now, uh, if you want like detailed instructions, you can read these at home, how to do it, but or you can watch the video, whatever you prefer. First steps, here we go. This is it. We're going to start now. So let's use the interpreter. How do we how do we get into the interpreter of Python? It's kind of like the brains of Python. Well, we did it already. We're just going to type in Python 3. Hit enter in the terminal, and you'll be in the interpreter. How do you know that you're in the interpreter? You'll have three greater than symbols. See them? Right there. That means you're in the interpreter. Let's get out of the interpreter. Do it with me, OK? Don't just watch, but do. So let's go Control D. We're out. Now, where are we? Python or Linux? We're in Linux. How do we know? Because there's a dollar sign there. See the dollar sign? That means we're in Linux terminal. Let's get back to Python. Now, I know what you're thinking. you got to type in Python 3 again. Gosh, there's a lot of typing. No, you don't. You just have to hit arrow up. One key. Arrow up and Python 3. And now we're back into Python. Yay! Now, let's actually type something. Let's type this command. Why are we going to type? Why are we going to run a line that says "Hello World"? Because every single programmer on in the entire world runs this program as their very first program. You must run "Hello World," or you will never become a programmer. Okay, let's try it. Here we go. Print. Bracket. Print requires br brackets. Then you go quotation, hello world. Close quotes, close the bracket, and then here comes the moment of truth. Hit enter. <gasps> Ta da! You are now a programmer. Okay? If you want to insult someone who's a programmer, you just say, man, you're not even good enough to write hello world. That's pretty much the worst insult you can give anybody. Okay? So, um, let's continue. Let's go back to the book. You know what I'm going to do? Oh, look, watch this. I'm going to grab this thing. Let's pull it over here all the way to the right and let go. And it takes up half the screen. Let's grab this guy, pull it all the way to the left and let go. And it takes up half the screen. Nice. Now I got my terminal here and my book here. Awesome. Okay, so there is the interpreter. We did that command. And yeah, we know we're running what version we're running. That's the version they have. This is the one we have. Can you guys see my mouse? Yeah, you can. All right, now. Yep. So as soon as you type in that one line, 
it executes that line immediately. So you can test things like that. Okay? You can test out if it if if like it works and it's a it's a really neat way. It's um, compiled languages don't have that nice feature of being able to just like try one line at a time and see what happens. Okay. Um, next. If you are using yes, right, how to get out of it. Okay, so this is showing you how to get out. You guys remember how to get out? Con try it again. Control D. Get back in. Try it again. Python 3. I want you to get really used to getting in and out of the interpreter. Okay? Arrow up. <coughs> and, you're, and you're back in. Okay. Now, there's a little bit here about choosing an editor. And they're going to tell you to use PyCharm, which is super awesome. But I'm going to ask you to use Genie just because I want you to have the same um, environment that you do in here as you do at home. OK? And yeah, see, they talk about Vim and, and another one called Emacs. Yeah. For more for later on in your career. So let's scroll down through. This is telling you how to use PyCharm. That's another editor like Genie, but probably a little bit better than Genie, but it's okay. Genie's going to be just fine for us. Um, I'll show you the nice thing about it in a minute. Okay, so we're kind of at the end here. We're at the end of uh, first steps. Now let's learn the basics. Let's click on basics. <coughs> so we learn how to print something. But notice you can print something with single quotes as well. So notice when I did print, I can also do like this. Yay, that works as well. Now you have to be consistent. Okay? So in other words, if you use double quotes, you have to close with double quotes. If you use single quotes, you got to use single quotes. You can even use, watch this, triple single quotes. Ready? That works too. Wow. Well, what are triple quotes for? Well, if you want to make something like this, watch this. Ready? If I did... Oh, I got a backspace over this. Okay. If I did, hello world, I love you forever. There you go. And now, that you can actually create a multi line print statement. So you cannot do that with double or single, single quotes. You need triple single quotes. Okay? Uh, so let's take a look at that. Now we're going to look at a comment. How do you make a comment? A comment is well, like this. This is a comment because it starts with hashtag. You don't have to have one at the end, by the way, so <coughs> that's good too. You just have to have the hashtag at the beginning. Anything that starts with a hashtag, it's a comment. What's a comment? Well, it's for you. It, th it will not be executed. The program will not run it. It's simply some notes in your code to remind you or to let you know how to do something or maybe to help other people understand what you're doing. Or probably even more important, it's to tell you to help you understand what you're doing two months from now. You go back and look at your code and you go, I don't remember why I did that. Oh, wait, there's the comment I left. Oh, yeah, I remember. That's what comments are for. 
Okay. Also, by the way, just to let you know, if you're working for someone, like a company, and you're writing code, most companies will demand, make it mandatory for you to create comments in your code. It's called documenting your code. Because if you quit or they fire you, or any other reason why they, you might not work there anymore, then um, they want other people to understand what you're doing. And so you're going to have to comment your code. But if you're a real programmer, it'll be the part of your job that you like the least. Okay. So now we're going to go on to literal constants. What's a literal, con literal constant? Well, this is called an integer. I need you guys to memorize things like that, okay? So just like math, <coughs> uh, that's an integer. That's an integer. That's also an integer. Any whole number is an integer, okay? This, on the other hand, is not. That has a decimal in it, and so that's called a floating point number, okay? Floating point. And then there are strings. Why is that a string? Because it's enclosed in quotes. Here is a trick. Don't be, don't be fooled by this, let's say, uh, on a test maybe. If I ask you, what type of data is that? Is it an integer or is it a string? Answer? It's a string because it's in quotes. Okay? So I know it looks like a number because it's one, two, three, but it's it's not an it's not an integer because it's in quotations. Okay? This would be an integer. See the difference? Anything in a quote is a string, even if it's a number. All right. Oh, right. I know what you're saying. Right. So, like, what about this? Is that a string or a number? No, it's a string because it's in quotes. Okay. There we go. So here it says uh, floating point numbers. Oh yeah. And also, floating point numbers can have exponents too. So, for example, I could say. Um, the speed of light, 3 to the power of 8 meters per second. Whoa, look at that. So if you go 3E8, that's shorthand for writing eight zeros after the 3. It's like going 3 times 10 to the power of 8. Same thing. But it is a floating point. Okay, notice the decimal place. Also, uh, you can use a capital E if you wish. Okay? Now Python, um, also you can you can use strings. Oh, I was gonna kind of jump in ahead a little bit, but um, you can use single quotes, like I said before, and double quotes and triple quotes. Notice that the triple quotes you can have multi-line. Triple quotes, by, um, by the way, are special. Because you can also use triple quotes um, for multi-line comments. So if you want to make a comment that's multi-line, I can go like this and I can go la 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 or whatever. And then can do that too. Well, that, that just turns out to be a string. Notice that it puts new line characters in there. So for example, um, if I went print and I said hi backslash n this 
backslash n is a backslash n comment. This is not a comment. This is I'm actually printing it. But notice the backslash n is a new line character, and it'll print those. The backslash n is, is you're escaping the n. So what that means is you're treating it specially. And so it ends up not printing like a regular n. It becomes a special character called the new line character. So in other words, these two characters together, the backslash n, make up one character, which is called a new line. And so we could have used triple quotes there to print it on different lines, but we can also mimic that behavior with the new line character. Okay, so in our notes here, it says strings are immutable. That means we can't change them. By the way, just for your you know, trivia, integers and floating point numbers are also immutable. You can't change them once you create them. So how do you create them? Well, watch this. If I say x equals 1, now x is storing an integer. If I say um, pi equals 3.14, now the word pi is storing a floating point number. And if I say name equals, now I'm going to store a string in there. And I could say hello. Now each of those variables, x, pi, and name, are storing different types of data. If I hit in the interpreter, you can just type in the name of the variable, and it'll tell you what's in there. But in a program, you'd actually have to go print. And we, we haven't made a program yet. But you could also, if you print it out pi, then it'll show you what's there. And printing it just basically uh, displays the information that's inside the variable to the screen. OK? So here's an example of a variable called age, and it's storing a value of 20. Here is a variable name called Swaru. Okay. I want you guys to try and now this is actually using for dot format. Um, if I make this bigger, you can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Where are we? Numbers, strings, format. Yeah. I don't personally use this method. I don't personally use dot format. I use something called f strings. And now, not to say that this is wrong, it, it's fine, but I'll show you what. So notice, I want, I want to show you what's going on here, okay? What is this curly brace zero? It means it's saying the first argument of the format. So if we start counting, oh, by the way, wait, stop. Alert. We have to take a timeout. This is super important. Okay, I'm about to rock your world. In computer programming, the first number is zero, not one. So how can you tell a programmer from a regular person walking down the street? Stop them, say, can you count to 10? And if they go one, two, three, four, five, they're not a programmer. If they go zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, they're a programmer. That's how you know. Now I want you to remember for the rest of your life, as a programmer, you start 
counting from zero, not one. We all good on that? So what's the first number? Zero. zero. Well done. Excellent. If there's something that you have learned today, that should be it. Okay. So notice that's the first variable, so that's zero. So this will print out. So what is name though? Name is a variable, but notice he's assigned it to Swaroop. So the output will be Swaroop was, and now the number one variable, which is the second variable, it's age, here it is. And the age was assigned to 20, and so it'll print out Swaroop was 20 years old when he wrote this book. Wow. Um, but am I going to ask you to do it like this? Nah, I don't like this particularly. It's, it's a lot to remember, I feel like. There's a simpler way. Okay? And that way, yeah, I, I used to do it like this uh, a while ago. But I think this way is old-fashioned as well. Uh, you can concatenate. I know that's a weird word. Basically, it just means like glue together. You can glue strings together with the plus symbol. Um, and so you can go, Swaroop is 20 years old. That's what this would produce if you printed it. Okay, so watch, I can try, I can do it for you. Ready? So if I said, uh, Let's say if I say name equals arc. Now notice it's a string, so I have to put quotes around it. And I say age equals 35, because that's my age. Um, and um, if we uh, now go print, and I said uh, name plus is plus, and that, well actually I'm going to need a space here because, well let's just leave it out and then you'll see what it looks like later. If we go n name is age plus and then years old. Okay, let's run that. Uh oh, wait, I messed up. What did I mess up? Oh, right. I messed up because age is not a string. And we can't actually we can't actually print age because it's an integer, so we'll have to change it. Nope, we'll have to change it to a string by going str. See how much work this is. Now it works. Arc is 35 years old, but it kind of sucks because there's no spaces in there. So ah, oh, God, now I gotta come here, <coughs> and I gotta come over here, and I gotta go. Um, put another one after there and put another one here and all right that's that's a bit better this this is not a good way to do it okay what's better than this well let's have a look you could use format and actually you don't even need to specify what number you want it'll take them in order still i don't like this okay um you can you can name the arguments you want in format. I think this is even worse. If you, if you want to confuse students, teach them this. Okay? Aha! Here we go. Dun, dun, dun. This is the one I want you to learn. This is the good one. It's called, and it was introduced in Python 3. Thank goodness for Python 3. It's called F strings. Look how easy this is. Look at all you gotta do is put an F right there. Okay? I think it stands for formatted, pretty sure. Um, and now you just put the variable name in the curly braces that you want printed. So for example, if I was to do it here, here, let's move, I would go like this, ready? I would say print bracket F for the F string, quote, and then I would say name is so it's just like I'm writing English except whenever I want to put in a, a, a variable I put the curly braces age 
years old. And now I don't have to worry about converting anything from integer to string. Ready? Boom. Don't you think that's better? Yeah? Don't you think that's a lot better? I think it's better. That's the, that's the cleanest way, I think, to print stuff in Python is using f-strings. Okay? But I still want you to be, especially, well, uh, I, I do want you to be the, um, not so much the format. I'm not, I'm not really crazy about this one. If you don't learn this, I don't really care that much. But this one has some importance. So the concatenating one has some importance because you can actually create other variables by concatenating stuff. Okay, like other strings, you can create a new string by concatenating stuff. Okay, and it's it's very common to see code that has the plus symbol. So plus can be used for numerical addition, and can, it can also be used for concatenating strings. Let's take a closer look at that. So if you'll notice here, if Python can be a I used as a calculator, so if I went five plus four, oops, I didn't use plus. 5 plus 4 is 9. Nice. Oh, man, you can do any math? Sure. Uh, 3 times 5 is 15. Oh, this is awesome. Wait, that's times? I thought times was an x. Nope. In computer programming, times is a star. So 8 minus 3 is 5. Nice. OK. And, um, here's, and ready for this? Here's divided by. Uh, 8 divided by 2 is 4. That's divided by. Okay? Now, why am I showing you this? Because, are you ready for this? You can do these types of operations, some of them, not all of them, but you can do some of them with strings. Ready? Watch this. Uh, let's go, for example, cat. Okay? Plus dog becomes cat dog okay I should have done hot dog that would have been a better example um, but you can concatenate or glue strings together with a plus symbol so now the plus symbol if it's numbers if it's integers it does an arithmetic operation on them if it's strings it glues them together see that so if that's true then can we do this can we do cat minus dog? No. Ah, darn it. We can't take away a, a dog from a cat. Um, can we divide a cat and a dog? I don't know what that would be in real life. I don't even want to think about it. But, nope, thank goodness we can't do that. That's like messing with uh, biology or something. Can we multiply a cat and a dog? No, we cannot, thank goodness. However, so far the only one we can do is the plus. But there is one thing we can do, which I haven't shown you yet, and that is, are you ready for this? We can multiply a string. Not by another string, but by an integer. Huh? Watch this, ready? Two times dog. What's that? Dog dog. Isn't that amazing? Whoa. That's so powerful. Wait, you know what? Listen, I have actually seen students like try and make a string and, and they want to go like this. They want to go A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. And, and they want to have the letters A, B, C like 20 times. So I've actually like walked by a student typing A, B, C 20 times. And then I go, I, I put my hands on my, oh no, no, that's not the Python way to do it. And they look at me with these blank eyes. And I say, if you want A, B, C 20 times, you just go like this. You see what I mean? That's the Python. That's the, now there's a specific word, it's called that's the Pythonista way. You're, a, you'll, you're becoming a Pythonista. Sounds so cool, right? All right. Well, 
Um, so we kind of learned about how to do print statements. I want you guys to practice this at home too, by the way. Okay, so you don't have to learn every single format one, but at least let's say, for example, try this one out. Uh, definitely don't do this one. This one, I have no idea why they put this in there. That's just trying to mess you up. I think all they're trying to do here is to show you that they can have named arguments here. Um, I don't understand the purpose behind that. Um, but the one, like I said, the one that I use the most is f strings. Okay? Then here we go. There's, there's another thing where you can do format stuff. So um, decimal precision. Okay? So for example, if we go. 1 divided by 3. Okay, so let's try that here. Here, let's move this over. Oh, we lost our place. Where is, where are we? Oh, why did we lose our place? Okay, there we are. Let's try it. Ready? 1 divided by 3. All right, that's going to give us 0.333 repeating. But if you want to not have so many, then you can go print. Now, by the way, just remember, I could have just I could have also done print one divided by three, and it would give me the same thing. So why do print? Well, the reason is because this is the interpreter, and in the interpreter. We can just issue, we don't have to use print, we're going to see the result anyway. But if you did this in a regular Python program, it would do nothing. Because it wouldn't actually print the result in the execute, in the execute, when you execute the program. You have to print it for it to show up. But not in the interpreter. In the interpreter, you can just type in the expression and the result will show up. Make sense? So we haven't written a program yet. We're getting there, but this is kind of like the beginning. All right. Um, so here we can go print, and then we can say we can start doing some formatting. We can say uh, zero colon point three F and then close the curly braces and then we go dot format and then we go one divided by three. Now remember, look at all the brackets that I have to remember to close. Okay. So I want you guys to play with that, and there's there's different things here. There's different examples. Uh, here, oh, this is a really, really, really important one. Okay, try and see if you can figure out what these numbers in here represent. Okay. Is there any relation between this three? In other words, three digits after the decimal place. Let's see if we change that to a four, what would happen? Makes sense, right? OK. What if we did, um, how, about we, how about we go, um, how about three divided by two? Okay, that's 1.5. Um, how about I'm trying to think of one where how about uh, 5 divided by 3. Yeah, that's the one. So 5 divided by 3. 
okay? Notice it ended up uh, rounding up the last one because 6 is bigger than 5. Okay? Um, this thing is important because it says end. And, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to, to test this out in the interpreter because in order for to test that out, you're going to have to actually write a program. Okay? And so we'll do that next. And then there's escape sequences, which we kind of talked about before. Some common ones were the backslash n, and another one is backslash t. Then there's things like raw strings, variables, uh, identified data types, and I think that's going to be near the end. So I'd like you to go through basics at home. We're running out of time today, so we'll stop there. And uh, you guys can practice like this in the interpreter when you're at home and uh, give it a shot. Okay? Uh, yes, question. What does format mean? In pi what does where? This thing? Um, th these are the arguments that are this is this is what's going to be evaluated. But so you think of this as like the variable, but in this case it's evaluating five divided by three. So that's what's being printed. And this in the in the curly braces is where it gets printed. That's how format works. Okay, so that's one advantage of it. Um, now the zero here. So let's try let's try doing this in a let's try doing this in a, in a um, f string. Let's see if it'll work with an f string. If I went uh, Same thing. You see, so this zero is saying the first thing in here, but there is only one thing in here. It's five divided by three. So this is saying the first argument. The full colon separate it separates the, the formatting of it. In other words, how do you want it to be written out? And we're saying we only want it to have four decimal places. So this zero here is the same zero as it was showing us up here in the dot format. Uh, remember how it showed the zero? Not here, but like right there. That zero is the same as that zero. But you can't see the rest of it. So, oh, now I lost my place. Anyways, that's the end of this video and class. <laughs>